welcome, one and all, to the mutual friend. I'm Matt. And I'm Dre. And I'm Gabe. And today, we're going to be breaking down a very special topic with a very special individual. This man has been a good friend to us for, it's only, it's surprising, it's actually only been like a year, less than a year and a half. Yeah, a little over a year. But he's been a good friend to us, been a a piece of our ministry and young adults, always willing to serve in some way with his, his talents. This guy, I feel like just our conversations, you and me, I feel like at, at any point, if anybody put a microphone up to us, any of our conversations could be a podcast. So I'm kind of interested to see how this is going to go. I'm happy to have him here. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Seth Redger in the building. Hey. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. I've been like super excited about this episode for like quite some time now since you guys asked me, hey, you want to come on? So like this means a lot. So thanks for having me. We're glad to have you. Glad to have you. So the four of us today, we're going to be talking about venting and mental health in general. So I wanted to start off by saying, as you notice, the four of us are men. So we're going to be better equipped to talk about this topic as it pertains to men. Now, that doesn't mean that what we're going to be talking about doesn't affect women at all, because it does, because we all have mental health that needs protecting and caring for. But just keep in mind, we're going to be speaking more from the perspective of men, Mm -hmm. as we are men. So I wanted to start by addressing the stigma that is placed on men and mental health. Because often, men don't take the best care of their mental health. Mm -hmm. And society doesn't really push us to take the best care of our mental health. And society doesn't really contribute to our mental health being in a good state. So I wanted to start off just by addressing that. Like, why is that the way that it is? See, for me, this is such an interesting topic because, like, you know, as I've talked about on the podcast many times, I have lots of trouble expressing sad emotions. Uh, You guys have probably never seen me cry before. The last time I cried was probably, like, two years ago because of grief over uh, the death of a loved one. Mm-hmm. And it takes it just takes a lot for me to cry. And sometimes stuff happens that I'm like, dang, I feel like I should cry over this, but I like just don't. And I think part of it probably goes back to just crying wasn't really like a, a thing that was uh, like championed during my childhood. Not that it was like, negatively view but it just wasn't Mm -hmm. ever like discussed and i always bring this up kind of as a joke but also it's very pertinent to like how i viewed that expression of emotion whenever i'd be on the playground as a child and i'd be like y'all ever try to like balance on that little like curvy thing right on the playground and then like sometimes i like fall off especially when i was really little because i had no balance and coordination Mm. which you know carried but um, I would fall off. I'd like hurt my knee or hurt something. Mm-hmm. And I would like maybe start having a tiny bit of tears. Mm-hmm. I remember my dad would just look, just look at me. He wouldn't say like, stop crying. Or he wouldn't be like, oh, are you? he just. Boy, get up. <laughs> you just wait. You just sit there. Just be like, what you doing? Yeah. Like, yeah. what's going on? And then like, it kind of like, kind of put in my brain like, I guess I don't have to react that way. Mm-hmm. And I think that's kind of just how it kind of stuck with me for a long time. And of course, like, I think all of us were raised during a time kind of right before, like, you know, boys were ever encouraged to really, like, show emotion. Mm-hmm. So I think even during our upbringing, it was, like, weird to, like, mm-hmm. show emotion like that. Do you guys agree or no? I feel like yeah. now, like, now, like, boys are, like, almost push to like show their emotions and stuff in a way that I feel like it wasn't the case when we were younger and especially when like our previous generation was younger I think like well real quick I have a question for you it'd be like 
as you got older and you realized like this is just something that you didn't do did that like did you ever look back and like did that ever make you feel a certain way that you were aware that you just like never cried or did that ever bother you or were you just kind of like yeah that is what it is no it didn't really bother me until yeah. like the last couple of years when we've been talking about all this vulnerability stuff yeah and everybody's sharing all their feelings i'm just mm-hmm. like dang i mean i guess i'm just like the terminator bro like i'm cool for real but then i realized i'm not actually cool it's just like yeah i don't express it in that mm-hmm. way yet mm-hmm. so yeah yeah i think like for myself see this is where like i'm really different um from like that regard um growing up for me like my dad and like my whole family has been like super tight-knit and just like was always very like expressive with our emotions um and so i was like i'm not good at hiding what i feel at all uh matt you you know this very well um like there would be times i'd walk into like church and Matt would be like dude what's going on like you just like you you're not locked in like you don't you don't look good um and and so like <laughs> i've said that to him. <laughs> yeah really <laughs> not not like that though yeah it was so, worse <laughs> you look terrible <laughs> I said that. <laughs> um but like yeah so for me um i don't i don't where i'm at now is a little different um but growing up i I always felt like I was able to like share how I was feeling. Um, not to the extent that I am now, but like I was, my dad was always like very much somebody who was very safe to go to about those things who um, he, he had, his father actually was very um, closed up. He didn't have a very good relationship with him, um, which as my dad got older, uh, there were some, you know, emotional, um, lack of emotional needs there and things like that. And so like, as my dad got older and, you know, got married and had us, he was like, I, I don't want that for my kids, you know? And so like, and I'm, I'm super blessed. I mean, I've sat down and I've, my dad and I have conversations where we're crying. I'm going, bro, me and my dad are crying right now, like in the living room, having these like heart to heart conversations. And it's, it's weird, man. Seeing your, old man cry you're like what's going on right now but it takes like it's like a different level of humi- humility just like sitting there and being like it is what it is like it is what it is like mm-hmm. your parents are human and it's it's really cool though to like share moments like that um because it just like i don't know adds a whole other layer um like to your to those who you look up to but okay <clears throat> I think for me growing up, like, I would say, like, from, like, when I was a baby to about, like, age 10, 11, like, I would cry, but not really, like, in public, but I would cry at home. But it would be over, like, stupid stuff, like, I wanted to get my way, and, like, my brother wasn't allowing that or something like that. So, like, it was more so, like, a vessel to get my way, from what I can remember. But, like, it was never, like, emotional Mm -hmm. crying. It... For me, like, I'm not, like, I don't think, I don't know if you guys ever seen me cry, but I've gotten close to crying. But I couldn't, like, get tears out, if that makes sense. Like, once. But it's, like, for me, it's just similar to how you how you were talking, but, like, I can get to that emotional place. But for me, I can't, like, it's breaking down in front of people. Like, not it. Like, I just got comfortable, like, being vulnerable with you guys. And like my family, over like the past like year, year and a half, two years. That's like a that's a breakthrough though within itself. Yeah, you know. But uh, it was just, and like Julia's definitely helped with that too. It's just for me, I can break down if I'm alone, mm-hmm. and I'm just like talking to the Lord. Like I'll like stop to the Lord mm-hmm. if it's like if it's like something that's really getting at me, but like. Other than that, I've never been, like, a crier in public or just, like, being able to, like, express my emotions to the fullest in that way. But I've gotten better at it, I, and I can see the growth in that area for sure. Hmm. That reminded me, the last time I actually cried was here at church recently. 
we were praising, we were worshiping the Lord, and the, it would just get into me. I started crying. But now that I think about it, like honestly, the only times where I can shed tears is if it's like a spiritual, just mm-hmm. like heaviness mm-hmm. of feeling the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. Or, like I said, the most re- the recent time would be grief. But that was a while ago. And they'd feel different. Like it's mm-hmm. like a, like when you're in the presence of God, it's more like a joyous cry. Like mm-hmm. I'm just like so overcome by God's greatness. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also I just kind of like, I think it's a good point to add like, we are all on a journey because I'm, I've still feel like I'm not to the point of like emotional self-awareness almost like cry yet. I feel mm-hmm. like that's going to take more time. And you just shared like, you're just starting to learn this now, like over the last year. So we're all that to say, we're all still on a journey and it's okay. Like you're not going to be exactly where you want to be. Um, but yeah. Can I just, a little side note, if uh, anyone that's on the sound team at Calvary could just hear this, if there could be a mic for the one of these like very spiritual Pentecostal moments happen that could come through the in-ears, because in that cage, there's no mic for it. So like that time when everybody, like it was just, there was no sermon. It was just like praise and worship the whole time. I heard nothing. Dang. Like I only I could hear the I could hear the musicians I could hear the singers I could hear like nothing what was being said, dang, and like I was just like waiting for Pastor Edie for the cues, dang. so, you know, Dan, get on it, not Delumbo, but Hammock, just to be clear, <laughs> man, no but um, it's interesting because we're talking about kind of like the stigma thing. And sometimes I feel like, oh, man, like, am I really, like, a human being? Because, like, I don't cry. But, like, not everybody's a crier. Mm -hmm. Like, not everybody expresses their emotions in that way. And, like, that's okay. But if you are, like, that's also fine. And you don't need to cry to, like, show you have emotions either. Right. And some of you said, like, how you cry, like, when you're alone or whatever. Like, honestly, the most times that I felt like I needed to cry was, like, in empathy, like, to other people Mm -hmm. I like it would make me emotional but like honestly like when I'm just by myself it's very rare where I would feel like I need to cry you know yeah I think like with that and and this is something I kind of just thought about sitting here talking about this is like everybody yeah everybody's at a different stage like emotionally and um and I think in in some ways with how we're emotion everybody's wired emotionally wired differently and that plays into also how like the Lord uses them in in people's lives. Um, I'd say, like for myself, um, I feel things very deeply. Um, I have no problem expressing that. I have no problem telling people my weaknesses. Um, now, is it hard sometimes? Yes, but for the most most of the time, I don't really have an issue like expressing any of those things. Um, and it's been like really cool though to see how God has been able to like pull me out of that like stigma um, through um, personal this life experiences um, through therapy. Um, as I've told you guys about, I've been in therapy now for a couple of years, and to see how the Lord not just has brought healing to my life, but is healing the people around me and they're becoming more emotionally aware. And it's like, and like they're getting healing and like, I've been able to bring people to the Lord because of it too. And it's like, it's a very surreal thing to be a part of. Cause like I went into therapy, like, Oh, like I'm in this for me to get help. And then like, I came out of it and then here I am like sharing my story with all these people. And they're like, Whoa, like that's crazy. Um, and so, like, for me, like, it's a very, it's been a very powerful thing. Um, something that I'm actually going to pull up here. Um, when I first started therapy, there I had to do this uh, personality, like, test. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of this, but it uses uh, four animals. It uses a lion, an otter, a lion, an otter, a beaver, and a golden retriever. Have you guys heard of this before? I've heard of it. So basically the line represents like 
its strengths are like leader, visionary, persistent, direct. Uh, weaknesses are like insensitive, impatient, stubborn. Uh, otter is like outgoing, responsive, enthusiastic, compassionate. Weaknesses, impulsive, undisciplined, unproductive. Beaver, analytical, um, industrious, organized. Weaknesses, touchy, self-centered. And the list goes, like golden retriever, you know, calm, lovey-dovey, humorous, weaknesses, indirect, resist change, all that stuff. So um, when I first started therapy, my therapist told me, uh, he goes, his name's Mark. He said, Seth, um, through your time in here, your personality is going to change. Mm-hmm. I didn't know what that meant. Like, I was like, oh, okay. Um, and... I'd say when I first started, I was introverted. I was more quiet of a person. Um, And when I took this test, it was like I had to circle like each personality on each thing um, and each column. And like it, like each one like added up to like two points or something like that. And at the end, I would just add up all the totals. And like that's like what I was most of. And I think it was like for me, it was like the golden retriever and like. I think like the otter had tied or something or like the beaver had tied, like the analytical part and like the happy, like loving part. Um, and then over time, as I like went through the process of healing and like God was like, I was in a season of isolation for probably like eight or nine months of God, just like tuning me and just like being in his word and journaling every day. And like, I was just a mess. Um, and, uh, I came out on the other side and um, I was more confident, a lot more outspoken. Um, I want to say aggressive, but I don't feel like that's the right word to use. I feel like just like I was a lot more bold. Mm -hmm. Um, I was doing things I would not normally do. Um, Like I, and it just like, it was, it was changed me in a way that as I was able to lean in into my stuff um i was becoming more of who god wanted me to be and i was actually moving into a place of freedom because i was able to say okay lord like i'm gonna go into my junk with you and not put limits on it and because of that like there was so much fruit and like freedom uh like through all of that when you first got that assessment, how did you feel about it? Did you agree with it? Did it please you? And did you want to change it? Um, I was not against it. Mm-hmm. I think I was so ready to go to therapy when I went. I was ready to go. Um, long story short, I had just came out of a, uh, I guess you could call it like a situation shift that was really unhealthy. Mm-hmm. And like... Uh, that per that person had a lot of their just own hurt and a lot of things. And I didn't understand at the time that I couldn't like take it on. Mm -hmm. Um, and I mean, I was in my own place of not having any healing yet at all. I was stuck in my head. I had a bunch of stuff I hadn't gotten like figured out. Um, and so through that, the Lord used this person to show me like, Hey, like you need, you know, you need to take some time with me. You need, you need some help, you know? Um, and so when I went in, I just kind of, I took it all in like the weeks up to therapy. I was like, Lord, I just cannot wait to get into therapy. Like I was ready to go. Mm -hmm. Um, and I looked forward to therapy every single week and I still do. Um, so no, I, I, I was just like ready to tackle it on. I think looking back on that test, it's very cool. Mm -hmm. Um, and like my, my therapist, he shared with me like all all of his like he had done the test too like years ago with his therapist he had all this um like his one of his horror stories was like he walked into his like a friend's house and like a really close friend of his um he like walked into it to like his friend's house and hit his friend's wife was there. They're like, Hey, I've like seen my husband. She, he's like, no, like he didn't come over. I guess they're like having a game night or whatever. They walked in and he was dead. Oh, wow. Like just there. And like that, like from there on, like years of anxiety and like stress and just like a bunch of stuff. Um, he had like all these walls up 
and like he went into therapy and did that test and yeah he had like all kinds of like just aggressiveness and and all these things and and like over time like his personality started to change you know more of that empathy came out um it like a good mix of like that like that lion and that lamb kind of came out like that gentleness mixed with that like that boldness um but yeah so you were, it's more like I'm here for what I'm here for. You were like, all right, beaver retriever, cool, don't care. Let me get yeah, the process I, going. Yeah, because I, I was just so ready. I was like, I knew what the Lord, like the, the weeks leading up to therapy, the Lord was just working on, on my behalf. I was like, okay, I'm doing this. I don't know where I'm going to go. I was worried about insurance. Like, mm-hmm. how much, like, what's this going to cost? Like, like, I don't know. Therapy's expensive. If you don't have insurance, it's like a hundred, like mine is like $160 a visit if you don't have insurance. Mm-hmm. Luckily, I guess I have insurance. I pay like thirty dollars a visit, but like it's meant getting like mental help. It's not cheap, mm-hmm. and like I mean I get it, but like it was a scary thing. Um, but leading up to that point, I was like, I'm just gonna do this, and I was online looking, and luckily I was like, this guy looks like he'd be a good fit. Um, I put my application in, and I said, Lord. I don't know how this is going to happen if they take my insurance or not. Cause like the website didn't say anything about it. I got a call like 20 minutes later and they're like, yeah, two out of like 30 people take your insurance. And one of them happened to be the guy that I wanted. Hmm. And then like a week later he left that place and then I just followed him. <laughs> it was, it was like a pretty like crazy thing. So paint me a picture of what your mind is doing in this time. So situationship at war within yourself a little bit how how long did it take from like the point where you were like okay this is bad i need help to the point where you started therapy like what was that season like man so that that season of that intermission was probably like that from the time i was like i need help to the first day was less than a month, but it felt like an eternity because I, I just came out of it. Oh, I felt like I was going nuts. I was having all these intrusive thoughts. It was definitely like a mixture of mental health, health, but also in a place of like spiritual warfare was definitely happening in that time as well. Cause I was at a really like low state, depressed. Um, I was like crying all the time. Um, it was just like a really like, it was one of the darkest places I had been in. And, but in that time, the Lord was using it for me just to rest on him. Cause I was spending so many hours of so many like days, like out at a park and just journaling constantly Mm -hmm. and worship and just like with him. And like, I remember one day like calling the place and being like, Hey, if you can fit me in sooner, please do. Cause I'm not doing well. And by the Lord's grace, I got through it. And I, and I realized like, I knew what he was doing. It was about me just leaning on him during that time. Cause I knew he knew I was going to get through it. I might've known, but I didn't, I didn't feel that. Um, but yeah, it, that was like a really tough, like, I don't know, three weeks, which felt like three years. (laughs) Yeah. I think that's important that you pointed out the spiritual warfare aspect of it because that's not a coincidence. Mm-hmm. Like the enemy like waits for those moments. He's like, Oh, he's he's going through it a little bit. Mm-hmm. How can I like add yeah. to this and like mm-hmm. push mm-hmm. him a little bit, maybe get him closer to that edge? I was having um I was having like all these intrusive thoughts and stuff that were coming up during that time that were just like coming back at me. Um when I was younger, and this is something I'm I feel comfortable sharing now, but when I was like 16 or 17, I started having these like intrusive thoughts about myself, um, about like my sexuality Mm. and, um, that were coming at me and like, what if you're gay? What if you like guys and like all this stuff? And it was freaking me out as a 15, 16 year old, you're having thoughts like that. You're like, what the heck's going on with me? You know? Um, and I had never, I had never had like, any type of feelings or anything. It was just like, I always had these really creepy thoughts and I never knew what to do with them. Um, and as I got a little older, like I realized it was just like spiritual warfare and, and truth. And like, like the enemy was just coming at my identity as a guy, 
which is for any guy is very threatening. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was like years have gone by and I'm doing good. And it was like in that time of like stress and depression, all that came back and I'm like, oh no, what's going on again? And like in the moment, I was just like so like mentally just like stressed that I was so like in despair that I was like, I felt like I was going crazy with all those thoughts coming back and um, in everything. So it was, it, was a, it was a real season of just like isolation and pruning and the Lord just like, really just i was i was in the trenches so to speak so. you know <laughs> oh shoot yeah i tried to start talking and it didn't work <sighs> so it's so powerful that you're like just so freely like talking about your mental health journey and everything because that is not the case for most people I mean, most people aren't going to share um, as much as you were willing to. And most people aren't even, like, in touch with it. Like, they, mm -hmm. don't, they don't even know, like, how to look mm -hmm. into, like, what's going on in their minds and realize, man, I might have some things going on that I need to mm -hmm. deal with. And I actually got some statistics to back up what I'm saying. So 40% of men have never spoken to anyone about their mental health. Mm. That doesn't surprise me. Does that me. sound accurate? That does not surprise me one bit. That's wild. I'm surprised, honestly, that it's this low. I would guess more like 60 to 70. Yeah. But 40% of men have never spoken to anyone about their mental health. 29% of men are too embarrassed to speak mm -hmm. about it at all. And I know this is definitely a fact because, you know, what man wants to show his weakness? Right? Mm -hmm. Not many. Um... 40% of men said it would take thoughts of suicide or self-harm to seek professional help. Hmm. So basically, it has to get to the worst of the worst for me to actually consider getting help. And this is also surprising. 20% say that there is a negative stigma on the issue, mm -hmm. which I think is another low statistic. Mm -hmm. um, and the last statistic I have here is nearly 1 in 10 men experience depression or anxiety but less than half will receive treatment and more than four times as many men as women die by suicide every year mm -hmm. walk through that again for me real quick yeah Slowly. yeah nearly one in ten men experience depression or anxiety okay but less than half will receive treatment and more than four times as many men as women die by suicide every year yeah. yeah and i think it's so interesting that all of that is kind of like one statement yeah because again one in ten seems low mm -hmm. right um but it's still saying again you got 100 folks yeah and 10 of them say that they deal with uh, depression or something but only five of them are actually going to go help yeah and you're still thinking oh that's probably that's a low number but if that was the case then how come four times is many men commit suicide than women yeah shows that men be struggling mm -hmm. we don't like to admit it like so uh, definitely a real issue i think <clears throat> with men what i notice is the competitive nature of us mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know us being as like they say hunters versus gatherers right um for men we have just this instinct to just go out and produce and when you feel like with social media mostly you see dudes on there with Lamborghinis yachts and it's like you just oh I gotta get on my grind I gotta get to that and then when you're not there you just mentally like oh I'm not good enough yeah and you just that like that like for women I know it's got to be different with like comparisons of just like you would know better than me, but just, like, comparisons about, like, who, what they look like or stuff like that. But for men, I think it's more so what you have because the more you have, like, the more you feel like you're worth Yeah. in today's society. Yeah. Also, I would add a big reason for not wanting help is, like, we kind of make a necessity for help synonymous with weakness, and that's not the case like mm -hmm. we're designed to be social creatures we're designed to work with one another 
we're we're not designed really to do much of anything on our own but yeah. for some reason we feel like we have to do everything on our own mm -hmm. and yeah. it drives us further into a, a bad place yeah, like yeah. jesus jesus didn't need any help but he had 12 disciples with him oh, so, yeah. talk about true, true you know it's interesting that we're doing the comparison between men and women because if you notice most women from the time that that they're little girls they always like travel together like even the simple stuff like they want to go in the hallway or whatever, they all go in the hallway. You move around like in school to go to lunch, everybody goes. Somebody has to go to the bathroom, they all go to the bathroom, right? And they have women from a young age, they develop this level of dependency on one another where mm -hmm. they're very, very comfortable with like sharing their emotions, yeah. sharing their what they're going through, and they're they're very like comfortable with developing good community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But men usually they aren't as tight with their guys mm -hmm. like girls, you know. And guys are much more prone to be loners, much more prone to try to like you said do everything on our own. Mm -hmm. I mean, the only time that I can really think of men, especially at a young age, like actually work with other guys is like for sports. Yeah. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Other than that, most guys are probably they're cool with being loners. Yeah. I have a question for everybody oh. actually including gabby even though she's 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 here somewhere um start with you guys huh? i'll just start with you dre um how many how many people do you think how many people do you would you say you have in your life mm. that you can be completely vulnerable with define completely vulnerable um you feel comfortable telling them about the skeletons in your closet? Four. Four? Okay. Yeah. Matt? I generally don't have an issue talking about whatever, mm -hmm. but people that I feel like I commonly do have those type of conversations with currently, I'll say about six. That's that's impressive. And, and like, I, I would have number. more if, if somebody, like, asked me, to okay. be honest, because I really don't mind sharing. I'd say for me uh, right now, probably three. Mm -hmm. About three. Gabe? Mm, I'd probably say three and a half. Three and a half. Three and a half. Oh, what in the How does that work? It just works. It works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Gabby, you can just like hold up a hand, yeah, hold up fingers or something. Four or five? Okay. Okay. I was curious. I was curious to see if like there'd be a distinction there, kind of like what you're talking about with like girls at like a younger age or just like being more dependent on each other. Um, but I feel like everybody here that's kind of like, that's healthy to have like, two or three four people yeah that number has grown for me though over time okay like most of my life it was like two mm -hmm. most of my life it was zero most of my life it was zero until yeah. about a well within the last two years like i got to a point where i was like i'm not gonna hide anymore i'm mm -hmm. not i refuse to feel alone like i'm okay with just yeah. talking but yeah. most of my life it was zero i think that's I'd say, yeah, the past couple of years, it, it's definitely grown for me more. I think growing up, I had like close friends, but I can, I can, there's one distinct memory. I, I can remember telling my friends something about myself, me like, like confessing something pretty, like I was freaking out about. It. I was like, dude, like I'm having all these weird thoughts. And they just like, they just like laughed at me. Mm -hmm. And like, that was a lot. Like be 16 years old and the, the closest person to you, you spent all the time with or like, Ha ha, that's really weird. Yeah. Like that's goofy, and I'm like, no, bro. Like you don't understand. Like this is what's going on with me right now. This is what I'm feeling. And they don't understand. And they don't understand. Mm -hmm. Um, I think right now the group of people I have in my life. Shout out to all of you in this room, including those who are not not with us. But like, they're not dead. They're they're just somewhere else. <laughs> just but like, they're like, I have some pretty great people in my life right now. Um, just who are just like. Uh, just real genuine people. A few weeks ago, uh, I was having a, a rough night at Bible study, and uh, 
I actually, Matt and I were out in the parking lot talking, and I started bawling my eyes out. This dude held me in his arms. I just, he hugged me, bro. And we were just standing there hugging. And I'm just like, like just bear hugging this dude. And I'm just like, it's like going at it. And it's just like, for me, I had never had that in my life. I went home, I was talking to my parents, and I was like, that was the first time in my entire life I've ever, ever had a friend just hold me and let me cry. And like, I've had a lot of people I've done that with, but to have that in return was like huge for me. And that was just, was like, meant like, volumes to me but. i didn't really talk about it at the beginning but like i am a big crier like i cry all the time mm. but like more more so for happy reasons i would say like that's great like if i'm listening to a song that just like really captures the way i feel about the goodness of god like i'll mm. just start bawling my eyes out like and i i cry all the time but mm. that's like on a personal level I also feel like I'm very empathic. So, like, I don't know if you noticed, but, like, I was in tears while that was happening. Like, I, I was, I was, <laughs> I was bawling my eyes. I kind of too. noticed, but I could also tell you had a, uh, that night, you had a, you, you had a lot going on. So, like, I, I did, I couldn't really on. tell in the moment, but I could tell you, you were, you were feeling something. No, that, I feel everything. So, yeah. like, if someone is telling me a story, I don't know if y'all have ever noticed this, but, like, sometimes when people are, like, speaking, like, I'll just, like, Literally, like, just close my eyes because, like, I'm watching. I dev I noticed yeah, that. Yeah, I've never seen Y'all be seeing that? Yeah. yeah. Really? <laughs> but see, like, here's the thing. I would have never said anything until you just said it now. I'm like, wait, he does do that all the yeah. time. Or, like, you'll, you'll, like, put your eyes down and just look down for a second mm-hmm. or something just like that. Just to, like, kind of tune into what they're saying? Yeah. That's cause, huge. Because, like, I want to see it so that I can feel it. And when I wow. feel it, I feel it like it was me. Like, not to not to say that I can fully grasp anyone else's experience because you really can't Mm -hmm. but it's like i have a hard time not feeling it when when someone is conveying their emotion yeah to you and they feel comfortable enough with you Mm -hmm. to give you that it's Mm -hmm. like like i i don't think i can avoid feeling it so Mm. so i i really am experiencing that with you as much as i can Mm -hmm. when when we have moments like that and I, that is something that I want to, I don't even know if it'd be like a stigma, but if we were to create a new stigma, that's what I would want it to be. You know, like that's like, that's masculinity right there. I'd say that's like biblical masculinity, you know, like that gentleness mixed with that, like the both, that the lion and the, the lion and limbs. It's like I said, that, that gentleness, that gentle spirit, but also just that, that boldness and to, to be there for people and to just express how you feel and like, uh, you know, do both. Does that make sense? But yeah. I think that's a part of why Jesus was, well, not think like, cause everything Jesus did was intentional. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely. He, he was the lion and the lamb so mm-hmm. that he could be the example yeah. that I can, I can do this and there's not a problem with it. Mm-hmm. Like he, he literally said, be as shrewd as serpents, but as, mm-hmm. Is, is it innocent as doves? Or some say wise wise as serpents and gentle as doves. There's lots of different hmm. yeah. translations. Yeah, you Let's need a combination. So, combination. Something that like, something I realized um, as I started my healing journey was my, you, and I can, I just can speak for myself, but like, you when you understand your yourself your like human nature you, you that's when your relationship with the lord can really grow cuz you're understanding the nature and like the heart of jesus the most is you when you become oh hello <laughs> when you become more in tune to yourself emotionally and in your makeup you're getting in touch with the lord yeah. and and all those things that he's put inside of you, yep. which then allows you to connect with him on a deeper level. Um, a verse in the Bible that really made me think about these things was um, Hebrews 4, verse 15. We love Hebrews. It says, For We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. When I first read that verse, it was like, 
okay. Like, yeah, I totally get that. But like after having all this time of getting in touch with my emotions, journaling, talking with people, growing closer with the Lord and like people around me, I saw that verse in like a whole different light. I saw that verse for all the all the things I'd, I'd been through, all the, like I said before, like all the skeletons I had in my closet. And I started to think about like, if the Lord was tempted in every way that we were, and he could empathize with every single thing, that would mean that everything I've ever thought about, every thought I ever had, every temptation I ever had, the Lord had to experience in some capacity, but he didn't sin. And that went to extremes like, like I shared about like the, like the thoughts I was having about my sexuality, like the Lord had to have had like temptations like that. And what I mean is that like, that's a, like when I first thought about that, that freaked me out. I was like, why am I like, think about that. But, but to, to really understand like the measure of like the Lord went, like if he can't empathize with the fact that like just having those thoughts or like that temptation of that, then like you wouldn't be allowed to have it. I wouldn't be allowed to have it. Then, then if he can't empathize with even something as dark, like just as that, then like, then the rest of the gospel and Jesus could be in question. You know what I mean? And that, and that was a huge changer for me when I thought about that, that there is nothing that there's nothing that Jesus hasn't experienced. There's no a single temptation that Jesus has not experienced or a, like a feeling or something, you know, because he had to in order, you know, so we could, he could understand us, that so we could understand him. And I think that that highlights the distinction that we've made previously. I think on the last episode we talked about actually is that the temptation is not the sin. Like, yeah. mm-hmm. like something happening and our flesh being designed the way that it is designed, mm-hmm. like... Those, that's just the simple, the reality of it is our flesh is this way yeah. and things in the world happen yeah. in these ways, yeah. but it's what we decide to yeah. like do with it afterwards. Mm-hmm. But Jesus understands anything that we could go through. Mm-hmm. Like how I said in the, the group last night, like that we're not creative enough yeah. to like think up some new mm-hmm. sin mm-hmm. that it would be like. God would be like disgusted yeah. with us even being challenged with an idea. Yeah. It's like no, yeah. like he understands us and what we're going through. You're not Dr. Doofenshmirtz, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Doofenshmirtz evil incorporated. You got this. What? Bro, my favorite uh song from that show is you're going to get busted. Dun, 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 dun. It's yeah, like it's from the right. first season. Oh, no, remember, remember that aglet that... Do you remember A-G-L-E-T. A-G-L-E-T. <laughs> aglet, don't forget it. <laughs> I, like the, I like the drummer guy. Um, you know what I'm talking about? I do not. Gabe? I ain't got rhythm. Um, I, I, I ain't I got rhythm. rhythm. That was the joint. Yeah, nah, was the, the best one's Pants on Fire. Pants on Fire? Pants on Fire. Yeah. No, no. Squirrels on my Squirt, pants. Yeah, Squirrels on my pants. pants. I said pants on fire. I was like, what? What does venting look like for you? Well, I guess we kind of just, we kind of just talked about it a little bit. Yeah. You know? uh, well, I can give two ways uh, that Seth just gave examples of. One was feeling comfortable with a good friend mm-hmm. where you can just be open and honest with them about things you're experiencing and the emotions that go along with those experiences so that you could either be comforted or, and this is important, if the person is looking for it, yeah, you can give suggestion mm-hmm. on like where to go from there. Mm-hmm. I feel like often people give unsolicited advice and it could be damaging. Because, yeah. like, sometimes I just need someone to be present for me. Yeah, like, I, I just I need to listen. Yeah, I don't mm-hmm. need you Do right now. Talk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't need you right now to say this is exactly what you need to do because this is what you're doing wrong. It's like, yeah. sometimes I don't need that. Mm-hmm. But then also, uh, if you want to talk more about this, in the case of seeking a professional, you know, I, I would say that is also a form mm-hmm. of venting for sure. I think uh, for it. 
I've I've been talking a lot, so I want to give room for anybody else who wants to. Dre, you want to say something? I mean, I just think like venting can be very healthy. Yeah, I found that when I get stuff off my chest the right way, that like I definitely feel better about it. Mm -hmm. And usually, I start to think a little more clearly on what my next step will be. But I think it's dangerous because you can fall into like kind of like an unhealthy like complaining almost, mm -hmm. and that doesn't really get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty of that. Um, yeah, I think uh, venting. <sighs> Sorry, I'm thinking. <laughs> I think of venting. I started thinking about Among Us. Sorry. <laughs> About Among Us. About Among Us, yeah. Oh, like too old for that, bro. Yeah, I'm I sorry. About that. I'm a child at heart. I mean, I I am eight I days am older than you, child so. Of God. <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> um, no, when I think of like venting, um, I think it, it's not a linear thing. Uh, there's so many different forms. I I mean, obviously, there's to people. Um, I think another form of venting is is journaling. Um, for me, mm. um, I'm going through a situation right now. It's a good thing. It's a healthy thing. Um, but I'm having to deal with like some like uh, past situations that uh, if I'm not careful, I'm going to allow to overshadow the present. You know, it's like, oh, well, this happened in the past, so this might happen now. And I'm having to like shift my mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I've just been like venting. Yeah, just writing my thoughts to me like, Lord, like this is what's going on with me. And I'm stressed out, and I'm worried. I feel like I'm going insane. Like, um, like those those are forms of venting. Um, where venting, going off of Dre's point, venting can become your situation that you're venting about can become complaining when you've talked about it enough to a point where. I think bitterness and other things start to show. Um, I'm guilty of this. Uh, like to this day, there are still things in my life that like happened a couple of years ago. And when I can talk about them, I can be kind of nasty sometimes. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, just the way I can come across. Um, and I'm like, you know, I really got to like let that go. Cause that, that complaining is like, it's just bitterness. And it's like, did I, did I ever really like really healed from that? Is that really resolved? Probably not, but um, there there is a there is an off switch at some point. I think mm -hmm. you know to talking to like not talking about it anymore, or if you need to, you know, yeah, go back to journaling or, or something. I mean, you're gonna have things that are gonna trigger you. Um, I have stuff that triggers me still, um, but yeah, I think there there definitely is like a line that I think does get crossed. Yeah. At some point. Looking real quick before you go, I'm sorry. Something that he just said just sprung something. When you have open wounds, mm -hmm. I guess venting should be a way to try to find some form of healing or resolution mm -hmm. to those wounds. If you're kind of just letting things flow from the open wound, then it's like it's going to infect other stuff in your life. It's like, are you are you venting so that this wound can be healed or mm -hmm. are you just spilling on the people around you, <laughs> the different circumstances in your present? Like, like what is the purpose of it? That's yeah. crazy. Go, were you going to say something? Yeah. I, I was going to say, that's crazy. So that was something I... The term I used was like you're bleeding on other people. On people. So when I went through the so the situation I went through a couple of years ago um, with a girl that I met, she had a lot of um, this like stuff at home um, going on just with, with her parents. It was like the the house she grew up in. I don't think they showed like a lot of um, like emotion and stuff. Um, so when it came to just like people expressing emotions or like feelings, um, this person just didn't have wasn't the greatest at just like expressing how they like they just kind of like 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 tense up like yeah. they didn't know what to do um mixed with some things going outside of that at, at work um i just came in and at a really weird time in their life um and so it was like 
yeah, they were in therapy and all this stuff, but they weren't like really doing any any of the work. It was just kind of like going in, saying the easy stuff and, and getting out. So um, it became a lot of like me pouring into them and them constantly just like bleeding on me yeah. and on other people. And when I think about it now, um, at the time when I was talking about with my with mark um he like i had a lot of anger that came up months after that i had a lot of anger i had i had not had any time to feel because i was so focused on this person that when it came up i was like like i was so angry um but like i'm losing train of thought here but is she just yeah she was like just bleeding all over people and the, the best way to put it too is now I'm not angry. It's kind of a, honestly, I look back and it's a very sad thing because you think you're, um, when you're not venting appropriately, what you think you're doing is you feel like you're protecting yourself and you're safe. But the analogy I like to use is like, think of it like a kid who puts their hand on the stove and they like burn themselves. It's like that. So when you never get the proper healing and you're not venting to the right people and you're not like sharing your hurts, and and your past and those things what you're doing is you constantly have your hand on the stove and you're constantly just getting burnt all the time and you're so comfortable in your pain that that just carries with you for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. and the people around you and that is like such a sad place to be in Mm -hmm. because there's so much like yeah you have to go back in order to go forward and you're going to go through the mud but ultimately you're going to come out way happier way healthier on the other side like when I met you guys, like last February, February. February yeah. yeah, I had just finished like about an entire year of isolation mm-hmm. when I met you guys. I had just like finished all kinds of stuff, and I was still continuing, but I was at a place where it was like I was ready to be with more people and to talk with people. Wow, look look at God's timing though. I know. Won't he he worked it. out. Won't he do it? Hey, hey. hey. <laughs> I wanted to um share this like little usurp from this article that like helped me gain like what like the difference between complaining and venting because I thought it I thought I explained it pretty well because it like the words and when you're in that when you're like venting or you could be complaining it's like the words that are important and how you're using them. So, like, it was saying, the example was, like, a teacher who gives, like, a lot of homework, right? Mm-hmm. Complaining oh. could be, I can't, I can't believe this teacher is doing this. Doesn't he understand we have lies outside of this? Like, why would he even do that? But venting would be, this this class is difficult. Mm-hmm. I knew graduate school would be difficult, but this schoolwork makes it feel like I'm drowning. Like, it's talking about the work, but not the mm-hmm. what's behind the work. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So, I think... When t- when com- when uh, comparing, complaining, inventing, it's the words that matter and how you're expressing yourself, mm-hmm. because that's like where the fine line really is. Mm. Yeah, I also found something that said this had this really nice statement that really summed it all together. Uh, complaining is a defense against the courage to change, while yeah. venting addresses the issues and inspires you to take action. Mm-hmm. So just like with that analogy. You know, what I think about complaining versus venting, when you're venting, at the end of it, you should have some sort of solution. Mm -hmm. There should be some action step, maybe not a way to fix the whole thing, but at least the next action step for you to take where you can grow from it. Yeah. But complaining, you're just, that's not really doing anything Mm -hmm. but forming bitterness, forming hatred, and wasting your energy and your time. So it's good that we're like in touch with our emotions and everything. But at the same time, we find ourselves just complaining about everybody, everything. I mean, it's honestly like a form of pride because it's Mm -hmm. like, it shows, it almost is saying that like, everybody else is in the wrong. Everybody is always doing this to me. And it's like, when you stop doing that and you just like, you talk things out so you can, again, see how you can grow from it. That's when you're in the right place. You said, it said complaining, as regards to complaining, you said 
uh, something about uh, something about change. Complaining is a defense against the courage to change. The courage to change. That is brilliant. It is. Complaining is fear. Mm. Venting is courage. Because mm-hmm. yeah. complaining is this is going on, this is going on, this is going on, and you're kind of complacent with your role in it. Venting is I've got something going on. I feel this way about this. And I'm looking for how I can change yeah. to navigate through it. That's yeah. really brilliant. Yeah. You know, I was talking to my friend today. I'm not going to read the text word for word because I don't want to give away any like major details. But um, I was talking to my friend today about something going on in my life right now. And it's kind of like when you complain a lot, you're, you're kind of building your own personal prison. Mm-hmm. And, and, and this, is, this is the way he put it with me, and it was so good. Basically, he said, when you allow yourself... For me right now, I'm, I'm dealing with um, a, new, a new thing, and I'm looking at my past, and it's like I'm, I can either complain and worry and try to like put the past in the... Like over, let the past overshadow... And basically, he's told me, he's like, you have to allow yourself to separate your new situation from the trauma of your old situation, and you have to break out of the prison cell you've built around yourself in response to that trauma. No two situations are the same. And I was like, dang, bro, preach it. Like, yeah, that's true. You, you build, you build a prison around yourself and you only, you're the only person you're hurting is yourself when you do that. Cause you're, you're so, you become so self-reliant. And deep down, that person just wants to be loved, really. Yeah. That person wants to be understood. That's, we're wired for, like you said in the very beginning, Matt, we're, we're wired for community. We're wired, we're social creatures. We're, we're meant to talk with one another. And when you're not used to ever having that, you just kind of shut everybody out. I want to share something else with you guys. <clears throat> this could be, this could stir something. I don't know. Oh, please do. Sir. I didn't. I didn't really agree with this, but he Cook. used scripture, so I like, mm. you know, what I'm saying. All right. So basically, I found this article. I don't know who wrote it. Oh wait, actually, I do. His name was Mike Leak. So it's, it's on you, Mike. Basically, he used Proverbs, chapter eighteen, verse two. It says, "A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion." Mm. And he used this verse to say the scriptures are very are clear. This is word for word. The scriptures are clear. Venting to our fellow man is the way of the fool. And he used that verse to say that. Oh, what are your now, thoughts? Okay. He, he, I have thoughts. Because I have another verse that I said might challenge. We got Bible for that Bible. Proverbs Ooh. 29, 11. Love Proverbs. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it until afterwards mm-hmm. and I'm gonna, t- I'm gonna be honest before this i looked up bible verses for mental health mm-hmm. and i'm thinking i'm about to find a bunch of ones that are all encouraging and all this stuff mm-hmm. but this was like the top three and basically i looked at a bunch of different translations basically the gist of it is saying that like you're foolish when you just talk yeah when you yeah, just yap it up without just without right. actually thinking through what's going on. And then again, it doesn't say like, you know, basically trauma dumps. And then, you know, it says basically like a wise man keeps it until afterwards. Mm-hmm. So that mm-hmm. means like there should be an important time where we process what we're actually feeling mm-hmm. before we actually start saying mm-hmm. it to folks. Um, and then kind of like, can you read your verse again? Yeah, please. Proverbs. 18, verse 2. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Now, that verse is very powerful mm-hmm. because you're, I mean, the, the Bible's right. When, o- when you're only concerned about your opinion, mm-hmm. how you feel, how what you think is right, and you don't want to understand what it actually is, mm-hmm. the truth, that's when you get in trouble. And I think that's where negative venting can come into play where maybe complaint can come into play because you don't actually want to understand what's right. Yeah. You just want to talk. Mm-hmm. You just want to complain and make it sound like everything's against you. And that's foolish. Like so, we talked about in the church episode. 
Exactly. Exactly. Getting affirmed. Mm-hmm. So I actually kind of uh, agree with that passage. Maybe not to the sh- to the yeah. stretch mm-hmm. that the article is saying, because again, we just talked about it for however long we've been talking. That yeah. venting is a good thing to a degree, yeah. but but you're right though. Mm-hmm. When you just want to just talk, just to have your opinion heard without actually understanding the truth, that's where a problem. For comes. context, the article basically, in summary, the article is titled "Is it okay to vent?" and he was saying more so it's okay to vent to the Lord. Mm-hmm. But not so much to your fellow man. That's like what he was trying to argue. I wonder, like, what the context behind, like, like just in general, like if I'm gonna go to you and talk to you about something that's considered like foolish. Uh, I wonder if it. Uh, I, I'm. I I really want to know, like, the what does it context? Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. what is the context behind it? Because it's like to me, he can say venting, but he could totally mean complaining. Yeah, you know true, what I mean. True. Like, I don't, like, I would have to sit down and be like, okay, so, like, what do you mean by that? Because when I read venting, it's like, right now I'm thinking what we're talking about. It's like, oh, well, venting, like, oh, I don't agree with that. But it's like, well, he might mean complaining, Mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So. I think for me, I don't talk about something unless I talk to God about it first. Sure. It's valid. So, like. It, even with like with you guys, like I've I've never like shared something with you guys if I haven't talked to length about it with the Lord, mm-hmm. because I just I don't feel comfortable enough to just I mean once like once I talk to the Lord about it, I've talked it through. So like just like talking about it is the hard part really mm-hmm. for me. So once I've talked it through, it's easier for me to share it with somebody else. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan of keeping your business like sometimes your business is your business Mm -hmm. but you can best believe if i'm going through it and i need someone to lean on (laughs) i'm gonna talk about it yeah but once again there's gonna be a goal in mind like why am i doing this am i just Mm -hmm. putting these things am i bleeding on the people that i love like Mm -hmm. unnecessarily yeah like i can see a solution Mm -hmm. And I'm going to move towards that goal, but I need help getting there. Mm -hmm. That's what venting is to me. I have one other thing I want to add. Mm -hmm. This is kind of like on the topic of venting and having people who like have kin, have been there. Have you ever had somebody who you vented to about something that was valid? Like your feelings were valid, Mm -hmm. but they were like, you're too emotional for me. Like, wow. I don't want to have to deal with that. Have you ever had that before? Hey, I've done that before. I'm going to be mm-hmm. honest. Really? Wow. Like, yes. like you were on the other end. You were like, I can't. Yeah. Hmm. Like, I'll be. And listen, this is not a do good you wanna, thing. Do you want to share it about I'll, it? Or? I'll share it. Okay. Sure. So, you know, I'm trying to learn how to be more empathetic. Of course. Right, to want to hear people out. But there have been moments where people will come up and be like, just dumping all this stuff. Mm-hmm. I'm just like, bro, sis, what are you talking about? This is like a lot. Yeah. And I always will make sure that I affirm them by saying like, I'm so honored that you would like share that. Mm-hmm. So they know I'm not Support. dismissing how they feel. Yeah. And I will tell them up front, your feelings are valid for sure. But at the same time, mm-hmm. I will also if our relationship is like that, I wouldn't do that to like a random person. But like yeah. if someone I know, I'd be like, I just want you to pause and really just think through what's going on before you make a decision out of emotion. Right. Which is valid. Yeah. But sometimes like when I like sense that, like my mm-hmm. guard is already up, like, mm-hmm. oh, like they're really just going they're just really on the emotional stuff. Right yeah. Now. Sure, and I think the best thing that you can do in that situation is, like, this applies to you, too. The person who's not feeling like they want to talk about it for you in that situation, it's like, you just do the best you can. You're not wrong for feeling how you're feeling. Yeah. I'm like that, too. As somebody who's, like, very emotionally just available person, very vulnerable, I'm almost where I'm like, I don't want to deal with this right now. It's like, <laughs> it's like all right, what am I going to do? Like, mm. I can choose to be a jerk and be like, shut up i don't want to talk about it yeah. or i can be like all right like i'm not feeling this right now but this person needs it you know and yeah. i'm just gonna listen yeah um, and that's something we can always do mm-hmm. we should always listen yeah. and make sure that they feel valid mm-hmm. all the time 
but you cannot always match mm-hmm. that person's energy at all times. I think this is something. I'm just make a statement to like anybody after who watches this. I've been in that seat where I have shared something and I've had the person that they say, you're too emotional for me. Mm. And that has oh, been, right. that was brutal to hear that. I was like, dang, like I, I felt like something was wrong with me. I was mm. like, that's wild. And to anybody who out there who is wired, that is just like, you feel that you wear your heart on your sleeve and you just speak freely about what you feel and are just like a shoulder for other people to lean on. That's a really good quality to have. Um, and don't let people just like take it for granted either. Um, but like, you're not crazy. Like you're not weird. Um, like share that part with the people who are closest to you, who respect you and understand that about you and like to help encourage you, like spur you on. Um, that like that is a that is an amazing quality to have and in this day and age it is very few and far between yeah so and um i kind of that was like a great like boat bow on the mm-hmm. thing i'd also say just like for people listening like just keep being you like if people are trying to like shame you for like feeling a certain way or like mm being in touch with your emotions, like, don't mm. let folks tear you down. Yeah. Like, keep feeling because someone is going to need it. Even if that person is just you. That mm. someone could just be you. And, no, and the other way, if you have trouble feeling certain things, don't feel bad that you have trouble feeling. If you're trying, that's good too. You're not a bad person if you have trouble feeling. There might be something that the Lord wants to do in there. And just invite him in. It's okay. You're not a monster. You're not, you're not rock and stone. Like he can, he can soften you up. No, there was something I can't remember if you were telling me this, but like going back to like being in a, being in that situation where like someone has come to you and it's just like it was a lot. Like mm-hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll say it again so I, I get the words right. Um, yeah. like my situation. Oh, um, like what they said to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, they said like you're too emotional for me. So I th- I can't remember if it was you who told me this or like you were just telling me a story. But I remember hearing a story where basically someone was telling them like all these things and like they were like, "I hear you. I don't know if I'm the right person yeah. to help you." Through oh, this. Yeah. So they like I've, I've said that a so lot. they've like rerouted them to like help. So they were like there for them, but not mm-hmm. in the way to the where you're not rejecting them. Yeah. That's that's a great thing too. I think those people also like have a like that's really wise. And so like there there is a level of like emotional awareness there too where you're like I don't think I'm the right person for this situation. That's yeah. that's really smart. Or I'm not the right person for this situation right now. Mhm. Like if somebody comes to me and I'm personally having a bad day or a tough time and I like I know I'm not going to be well equipped to properly handle it. Sometimes I'll say like like if somebody just like comes out and they're like, "Man, life's so awful right now." And and like I'm kind of in the same place. I'll be like, "Same." Yeah. <laughs> like like and that's I'm, sometimes I'll, what people need. Yeah. Yeah, I like, I'll be honest with folks like and instead of sometimes someone will come to you looking for help and instead of being able to help them, you'll you'll have a conversation. Yeah. Cuz it's like Hey, I'm down. I'm down here in the same spot with you, brother. Hey, yo, then, I'm down bad, bro. Hey, and, <laughs> and sometimes I've had cases where that's happened. Yeah. And now that we can have this conversation, we we somehow actually lift each other yeah, back up. Sure. Because it's like, like I didn't even feel like I was capable right now, but it's like we kind of bounced off each other's energy and like came yeah. to a, a solution or like mm-hmm. A, mm-hmm. a better understanding alongside one another, which. Mm-hmm. That's why I thought the key word in that verse you read was understanding. Mm. It's got to be some type of understanding to come to. Yeah. Any words you want to leave for the people? I'm mad. <laughs> <When I'm> just... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I'll just reiterate a couple things. Uh, one, honesty, as far as if you're the person venting or like we just mentioned... If someone is coming to you, like, 
you're not doing anybody any good by being untrue. Mm-hmm. Like just be just be honest. If you are venting or trying to help someone who's going through a hard time, like being transparent is going to be the best tool. And then also, like we said, don't bleed all over the people that love you. Like a desire for help, very healthy. Taking the action to try to get it, very healthy. But do not just spew negativity because that's only going to make things further damaging. But that desire for help for help is good. It's healthy. And it's not weakness. Yeah. My closing remark will be just this. Um, when you're feeling, the Lord wants you to feel. And you should go to him first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you find yourself being gravitated to run to other people before the Lord, your order is out of whack. Yeah. But also, it is important that the Lord, he provides us with people to vent to, mm-hmm. to share with, and make sure the people that you're venting to uplift you. Because they're just there to just be negative with you. I don't know if that's really actually being helpful. Yeah. So that's all I got. You gentlemen? Be a man, but with a healthy mind. Amen. Agreed. Yeah, I don't think I have anything. Does anybody have a song suggestion? I was looking for one, actually. I don't don't have one off the top. I'm not going to lie. I thought of, first of all, C.C. Winans just dropped the album called More Than This, and it has been living rent-free in my head the past couple days. I love it. But when we did the Battling Lust episode, I didn't have a song suggestion. But the third song on that album, I feel like it's a good song for that episode and for this episode, and it's called Too Late to Lose, basically talking about everything that the Lord has done for us. You know, Jesus has already died on the cross. He's already defeated death. He's already won all of our battles for us. Mm-hmm. So it's too late for us to lose. Mm. So when you're in that mindset of just being in a dark place and you feel like there's no solution, the solution has already come. Hey. The victory has already been won. <laughs> yes. It's far too late to lose. So that's my song suggestion. But go listen to the whole album for real. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Yeah. <coughs> I have no song suggestion. I, I don't have one. I don't have anything. No, well, CC Winans. <laughs> CC. Do you love me? <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. <laughs> right You're writing. All right, well. Can I do the outro with you guys? No. Oh. Anyway. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Of course you can. I'll be the... Why don't you lead it? Oh. Lead the outro. This has been the Mutual Friend Podcast. I'm Seth. And I'm Gabe. I'm Dre. And I'm Matt. Peace. Peace.